you are wronged by someone, where do you go? Hopefully to the person to express your concern. Then perhaps the two of you go to a trusted friend who can hear both of your positions and bring restoration. If needed, sometimes we go to a mediation or a court to define right and wrong. Isn't it amazing more that, that as we understand more of where someone comes from, we have more grace and compassion when their behavior seems initially offensive. Without God's wisdom and insight, our view of situations is severely limited. We long for crystal clear understanding of right versus wrong. The Bible and this passage declare, only the Lord God Almighty defines what is just and true. God is sovereign over his creation and his justice is solely supreme. Do you find yourself questioning God's authority, God's justice? Well, God always does right. And if you don't believe God always does right, you're in the wrong. <laughs> Our conscience is damaged. Our sin has blinded us. God is always right. His judgments and his justice is always right. God never does us any wrong. Will you please pray with me as we look into Revelation chapters 15 and 16. Mighty God, we long to know that your justice is right and true, that the way you have ordained everything is trustworthy and we can fall in line with you. Lord, teach us from these scriptures and what a, a great rescue plan that is for us. What a great way straightening that plan is for us. And we thank you, Lord. In your name, we pray this, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So Revelation chapter 14, it taught us God will judge sin. It taught us our choices have consequences. Now, before we get into God's final judgments in Revelation chapter 16, John provides a character resume of the one supreme justice, the one who is worthy and true. He is seated at his bench over all creation. Revelation chapter 15 showcases God's holy love displayed in his powerful judgment. His justice and vindication then causes all creation to worship. So God reveals his praiseworthy character in his powerful judgment. In chapter 15, Revelation chapter 15, verse 1, I saw in heaven another great and marvelous sign, seven angels with the seven last plagues, last because with them God's wrath is complete. How is this a great and marvelous sign? Well, with them, these last judgments, God's wrath is complete. And honestly, that's very good news. Sin is dealt with once and for all, never to entangle us as God's people again. Evil is addressed. Evil doers are sentenced. Justice is executed. And we want this, don't we? Because in our own humanness, we seek after justice in all the wrong ways. God does it in all the right ways, always. The previous judgments we saw were warnings with increased intensity. They, in some cases, had opportunities to escape God's wrath, but, but not now. There's no more escape for remaining unbelievers on the planet at this point. In, in Revelation, in this, this outline that we're seeing here, God's wrath is at its tipping point. This is the last of what God will do on planet Earth for heaven's sake. In verse 2, John continues uh, to describe uh, the sea of glass with fire and standing beside the sea of glass are believers, those who have been victorious over the beast. Can you picture them standing there? Absolute exuberance, utter gratitude, infinite worship because God brought them through. God's judgment was right and true in all ways. The red glowing sea, it showcases God's fiery, consuming, final judgment, and also then his protection of his people. With God's final judgment imminent, the celebration starts. The victorious 
harpists, they sing the song of Moses in verse 3. Mm -hmm. And the Lamb, the song of Moses and the Lamb. And this is one song with the same message. Moses' song in Deuteronomy 32 is a great song thanking God for redeeming them from slavery. The redeemed celebrate God's vindication and they sing of Christ's redeeming justice flowing from the cross. And they sing, secondly, of Christ's righteous deeds flowing out of his perfect character. So redeeming justice and then God's righteous deeds flowing out of his character. Let me read this to you. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the ages. Who will not fear you, O Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Now that is a worship song, isn't it? A song of when we know who is supreme. This song explains why God alone is the supreme justice. He is almighty. He has the power and ability to defeat our enemies. He gives us strength not just to endure, but to witness to our enemies. He has the right to rule all nations. God alone is holy. Against God's standard, all lives are measured. No humans have these types of credentials, and yet we, as sin-riddled people, have the audacity to question God's judgments, don't we? But we know sin ruins and destroys lives, and God has set a day to deal with it. The question you might have, though, is why doesn't he stop sin and evil today? Well, God gave mankind free will, so we choose to love him, and so we choose to love those in his family. We're not people forced to love. God wants our genuine love. And because there's no one like God, incomparable in holiness and worthiness and reverence, all people from all nations join to worship. In verse 5, the scene shifts from a heavenly celebration back to the great and marvelous sign. After this, I, I looked and there in heaven is the temple. That is the tabernacle of the testimony was open. And seven angels then come out of the temple. The covenant law, this is an allusion to the covenant law, and it reminds us God faithfully keeps his promises. God faithfully keeps his promises to his people. We see it all throughout the Bible. In verse 7, the seven angels hold the seven golden bowls, which are filled with the wrath of God. They're filled to the measure. Sin has reached its limit. And John has one really important thing to remind us. It is the God who lives forever and ever and ever and ever. <laughs> it's a, that's what it says in verse 7. All these were filled with the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. It tells you he is so infinitely patient. His sovereignty is so infinitely good. He longs for his people. And the temple was filled with the smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one could enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. So here's heaven's souls cannot enter because of the holy smoke of God. Does that remind you of when the smoke of God's presence filled the Israelite temporary wilderness tabernacle? No one could enter then. Uh, so they just had sang of his holiness, and now they can tangibly feel and see his holiness. His glory is so thick, no one can reapproach God until the seven bowls of judgment is complete. I wonder, what if God filled up our hearts so much, leaving no room for our personal agenda or our self-thoughts to enter? What if God filled up our hearts so thick with him? That's what he designed for us. It's what he designed with the Holy Spirit in us. God's purpose in this judgment is to make all things right and to deliver his people and to vindicate those who trust him and to bring justice and to set the suffering free by judging those who are evil. God's righteous character ensures a just and final judgment. God's righteous character ensures a just and final judgment. The world judgment carries negative overtones for so many in our liberal world, 
As Bible students, we see God's coming judgment as something to be eagerly anticipated and celebrated. God has to judge. God has to judge. Otherwise, he isn't the one true God with authority over everything. Sin has to be dealt with. We don't want sin to tentangle us for forever. So there are two options, repent or judge. Repentance or judgment. Do you know someone that you struggle who, uh, who struggles with thinking about God as a righteous judge? And why is that? Do you think God won't be just? The Bible teaching of God's judgment is rooted that he is good and wise and loving. He's the one who created us. He hates anything that spoils or defaces or distorts or damages his creation or us. He hates that. He has to be angry against that. No one is in a position to be more just than our loving God. Eternal punishment seems a hard sentence for those who, who reject God, especially when we love them. We love them when we don't want eternal punishment for them. And God clearly feels the same way. He created them. He doesn't want anyone to perish. He is patient. He's not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. And God has given humanity many, many, many choices and chances. Okay, looking at Revelation 16, let's read verse 1. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go pour out the seven bowls of God's wrath on the earth. Now given that the smoke presence fills the temple so no one else can be in there, God has to be the one speaking, right? And God warns the earth, God is coming after those who have worshipped the wrong person. The first bowl pours God's wrath on the land, and God marks with sores those who have taken the mark of a beast, a mark on our bodies in return for a mark of the beast, a mark for a mark, right? A mark that once entitled them to worldly comfort now is ugly, painful discomfort. The second and the third angel's bowls are poured into the sea and fresh water sources and life-giving water turns into blood and creatures die. It is terrible and tragic. And yet, to keep us from feeling sorry for the recipients of the judgment, the angel commands in verse 5, turn your attention back to God. Verse 5 says, then I heard the angel in charge of the water say, God, you are just in these judgments. You who are and who were the Holy One because you have so judged, for they have shed the blood of your saints and prophets, and you have given them the blood to drink as they deserve. God is holy and eternal. This spontaneous hymn echoes the song of Moses and the Lamb. It, it turns our attention back to God, and God's justice is served where God's judgment is deserved. God's justice is served where God's judgment is deserved. In verse 7, the altar responds, Yes, Lord God Almighty, true and just are your judgments. I love those attributes of God. True and just are you. God is affirmed. These martyrs who were under the altar uh, respond with affirmation of God's character and sovereignty. In verse 8, it explains the Fourth bowl is poured on the sun and it brings out scorching fire. And due to this intense horror and intense pain, how do they respond in verse 9? They were seared and they cursed the name of God. They refused to repent and glorify him. Three heartbreaking times they refuse despite the intense wrath. Verses 9, verses 11, and verse 21. They refuse to change their thinking or their lifestyle. They refuse responsibility. They refuse God's ways. And if they refuse God's ways, they receive God's consequence. That's how it works. They refuse God and they choose unbearable agony of their sin's consequence. The fifth bowl is poured out on the throne of the beast now. His kingdom and all are plunged into darkness. The physical horror for the spiritual darkness they pursued, and yet they still refuse to repent. The result of sin is judgment. Every person, you and me, face consequence for our sin. We're all guilty. But for believers in Jesus, as our Savior, 
divine justice is met in Jesus Christ instead. Jesus' own life given for us was payment for our sins. Will you let the painful consequence of your sin drive you toward God's forgiveness? Those who refuse to repent face dreadful punishment, consciously enduring forever and ever the torment that they have cast upon themselves. Does it seem excessively harsh to you? It offends a lot of people. But do you remember in the beginning, I gave you three key sections of Revelation. We first learned about Christ Almighty, and then we read his love letters to the churches, begging them to be in relationship with him. And then we moved to studying about God the Creator and God the Redeemer Judge in chapters 4 and 5. This set the baseline for the judgments in chapters 6 through 20. He's given so much love to people. He's responding in the way they've asked him to respond. When you understand the good character of the judge, his longing to restore you to himself, then you understand the love and the holiness that motivates the judgments. If God's bold judgments seem harsh, go back and re-anchor yourselves in the golden gate pillars of chapters 4 and 5. We must never underestimate the severity of our sin and how offensive our sin is against our most holy God who sent his only son to die for our sins. What drives such hard-hearted unwillingness to acknowledge and honor God? Well, it's pride a lot, isn't it? Impenetrable pride. Hearts that can't look behind themselves. Hearts that can't look outside of, of themselves to see that they are wrong. This is a picture of life without God. And how does a person get there? Well, one step at a time, one defiant moment after another, until it burns and builds the calloused heart, carving a rut that turns the heart to stone. Confess and repent. What sins is God revealing for you to confess? Repeated soul hardening leads to God's judgment and God's wrath. Desiring the world carves a rut that only repentance can drive us out of. Casting your life on Christ alone sets you free. Casting a life on Christ alone sets you free. Refusing God's grace means choosing vengeance for sin. Refusing God's grace means choosing vengeance for sin. The choice is yours. Our urgency to tell others of God's grace is really growing, isn't it? God sees all. He knows all. He's exceedingly patient in offering grace until the period of grace runs out. So will you trust him to use you to give every person in your life, your circle of opportunity, uh, opportunities to receive and respond to the gospel? In verse 12, it sets the stage for the final confrontation with God. Verse 12 says, The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. All right, so... God is removing a barrier between God's people and their enemies. This is the great river Euphrates uh, for the final day invasion. The Euphrates River protected Israel from its fiercest enemies, but now the dried up riverbed is no problem for kings to be lured like frogs by the demonic spirits. The repetition of mouth um, that, that we see in these is, is meaning they speak lies and deception and propaganda. Demonic spirits are, are that way. They, they lie, they deceive, and the propaganda they use to help to, to cause us to question God in his ways. And they will gather for the final epic battle between God and the forces of evil at a place called Armageddon. We're going to see that, and we see that in verse 16. We're going to see later in Revelation this battle is a suicide mission, however, because Jesus shows up, and in an instant, it's over. No contest. No contest when it comes to Jesus. He is already victorious. Jesus has won the battle. He has won the war. <laughs> Despite the judgments, they buy into the deception, though, that they have a chance to win the battle, and this is what opposing God brings. Delusion and ultimately defeat. Delusion and defeat. But now we're given a sweet surprise that we haven't heard since Revelation chapter 4. In verse 15, Jesus says, Behold, I come like a thief. 
Blessed is he who stays awake and keeps his clothes with him that he may not go naked and be shamefully exposed. This is grace motivated interjection. Right? Jesus is coming. Swift, unexpected, quick judgment. Don't be caught off guard. We do not know when, but it is imminently, imminently. Stay spiritually awake and spiritually clothed in Jesus' robes of righteousness. He has put his robe of righteousness on us when he calls us his. Stay clothed in his right thinking, in his right ways, and the things that honor him. And we know that when we follow him, when we do what Jesus does in the Bible, when we behave and think and act and travel in this life like Jesus does, loving people, making time for people, sharing the good news to people. In all the horror of these judgments, I was reminded of the story. A farmer rushed back to his property after hearing the sirens of fire engines, and he watched in vain while firemen put out the flames. And as he walked despairingly through the ashes of his ranch, he saw an old hen lying on the ground, burnt to death. Her wings were spread open, and in his anger, he kicked the old hen. But to his surprise, several baby chicks ran out from under the mother hen's burnt wings. When the fire came, the hen had draped herself over her little chicks and took the fire to save their lives. Our Savior did that for us. When the fire of God's holy wrath should have consumed us, Christ spread his arms on the cross and covered us in his own blood. Jesus prophesied in the Gospels his coming will be unexpected. He reminds us again, we have no righteousness in ourselves. His robes are the protective gear against God's wrath that we are due. So stay close to him. With Jesus Christ, we are safe and victorious. In verse 17, it's the seventh bowl and it brings history to a close. The judgments thus far have destroyed nature and man, but not the mastermind behind it all, Satan. And from this point on in the judgments, Christ will deal with Satan's religious system in chapter 17, his political system in chapter 18, and Satan's armies in chapter 19, and then the serpent himself in the very beginning of chapter 20. Hang on, we're going to walk through those together. When the seventh vial is emptied out, the throne and the temple of heaven unite, saying, it is done. It is done. The day of grace is over. The day of wrath has dawned. Now, I want to give you just a tiny Greek lesson because this is so fantastic to watch. It is done. Now, this certainly reminds us of Jesus' final words on the cross, right? It is finished. In the Greek, Jesus said, teleos, finished, completed, teleos. It is finished. But when God says it is done here in Revelation, it's another Greek word, actually. It, it's genomai, genomai. And that means new beginning, new birth. The new heavens and the new earth are being ushered in. Genomai, Christ's victory unlocks eternity. It is done. Genomai, Christ's victory unlocks eternity. In verse 18, creation implodes, so forth forceful is God's judgment. The earth becomes collateral damage, and Babylon, the system, uh, is split apart, and it collapses. In verse 20, it says, um, every island fled away, and the mountains could not be found. The people have no place to hide now from the wrath because they're not hidden in Christ. And even as 100 pound hailstones fall upon people, they curse God on account of the plague of the plague of hail, because the plague was so terrible, they still curse the name of God. God has given them a choice, and they choose to deny God. God created the world to be blessed and a fruitful place for people, but our sin ruined that. Sin has destroyed the world, and the ruinous effects of sin have to be purged. Jesus' judgment tears down the broken things so that he can make all things new. God's plan is in motion now to reconstruct heaven and earth cleansed and free of sin. And those who reject him disqualify themselves from redemption. God's final judgment is devastating, purposeful, and complete. God's purpose is redemption, not destruction. 
God continues to freely offer grace to you until the final day of judgment comes. So how do you treat God? How do you respond to God? How do you treat those God has asked you to showcase his redeeming grace? How often do we complain about being slighted while completely dismissing our undeserved grace? When you feel injustice, will you remember the perfect judge who stands right next to you? Will you embrace Christ's grace and forgive those who injured you? Will you love them with the redemption that changed your heart so they too embrace the gospel and they are spared judgment? And even when things don't go your way in this short life, will you give God his full right to rule over your life in his perfect way? Start today. Jinomai, Jinomai, God has declared your new beginning. Here's what I pray you believe. God's justice and grace is our new beginning. God's justice and grace is our new beginning. Will you please pray with me? Holy God, how grateful we are that we do have a new beginning in you. When we cast our lives on you, you free us from sin and the judgment our sin is due. And instead, you you clothe us in these robes of righteousness that make us free from the penalty we deserve. But more than that, it brings us into eternity with you. God, we ask that as you judge our own sins, as you judge uh, those around us, will you give us a heart for us to keep pointing to you, the God who has never done us any wrong, help all of us to trust you with our lives to not try to put trust in anything else or things that seem more comfortable or, or less painful or even less confusing than your plan lord but instead to trust the simplicity of your way that you jesus christ died for us rose again and have uh, lived to redeem us and intercede for us so that we are forever with you, Jesus Christ. It's in your great name we pray, Jesus. Amen. God bless you.